A few years ago, I made a video about this little handheld chainsaw. And it's very good. I mean, it really works surprisingly well. It's a cheap Chinese import from eBay. And my main issue at the time was that it's got no safety interlock. So if you're actually trying to handle branches, it's very easy just to accidentally give this trigger a quick squeeze and suddenly the blade starts running in the vicinity of where your hand is. The only way to make it safe is to take the battery pack off the bottom of it. He said, trying to get the battery pack off the bottom. There it goes. But at the time, I bought another chainsaw. I'll just put that one down on the ground and try not to stand on it. And this one hasn't actually seen the light of day. The main thing that I was looking for was a safety feature, and this one has it. It's got a little button here that uh, if you click it up with your this finger, you can pull the trigger and operate the chainsaw. But when you're not using it, you can click it down with that one and it locks the trigger. It's the, basically it's a reversing button, but being used as a lock button. And the way these come, they come with the batteries, a charger, they come with the bar, and they come with a chain, um, sometimes more than one chain. This one has other features as well, safety features. It's okay. But, because I'd made videos about that at the time, I didn't decided, right, okay, I showed it on a live stream and said, here's the safer one, but uh, I decided not to make a video about it at that time because it was going to be very much the same sort of thing. But recently I was using it in earnest. It's really, really good. Um, but I remembered that I had this safer one and went and found it. And I noticed the battery sitting in the ground next to it. And I thought, well, before I go any further, let's check the circuitry in these. Because there are some fake batteries floating around that have absolutely zero protection circuitry. They literally have the cells wired in series, but they don't have any uh, taps on the cells. And... Uh, I opened it up and thought, well, that's okay. I can see the taps in the cells here. But then I measured the voltage. Now, keep in mind, this is three years ago. That's probably my fault. Let's bring a meter in. This is one I've attempted to charge up. But there is a point you shouldn't recharge cells. And it's kind of, it's a mixed. It's There are two schools of thought. As soon as the cell goes, you know, anywhere below 2.5, that's it, it's finished. And, you know, you shouldn't attempt to recharge it. The classic TP4056 module will trickle charge them back up to 3 volts and then kick into the full current. But if you've really mega discharged a cell, I wouldn't recommend using them at super high current. And that's exactly this sort of application. But note this. If I measure the first cell, I charged it up to about 3.6 volts and it's been holding that. Uh, I've got a little chart here. I have did some tests. I did a test at 8 p.m., about 9.15, 11 p.m. and midnight. It's now approaching. Well, it is actually after. It's uh, actually approaching 2 o'clock in the morning. This is not a surprise for me. But anyway, the... Voltage went from 3, for this cell at the bottom, went from 3.62, set it down to 3.61, and that's absolutely fine, right? The next cell had gone really low, and it uh, charged up to 3.16, and then it went down to 3.02, and then 2.89, 2.83, it's now down to 2.75. That cell, or pair of cells, because they're linked in parallel, are self-discharging and that means there's a shunt inside and that rules out the reuse of this pack which is a shame because uh, if we continued up here the next cell 3.62 and it's been holding steadily the next one will be about 3.65 3.65 and the next one's 3.66 so they have uh, basically it's dropped a little bit well it the last one was 3.65 so it has settled down a bit when you finish charging cells, they, they'll settle down the voltage slightly. But um, if they keep lowering in voltage, that's bad news. But that's okay, because we're going to make the best of a bad situation. I'm going to take the circuit board off this, and we're going to reverse engineer it and see what circuitry is involved in this. But this other battery is the matching one. I've not charged it at all. And it is also dead. Let me show you the voltages. So, the bottom cell... Is at 2.05 2.05 volts. The next cell up is at 2.15 volts. You know, to me, that's almost a recoverable situation. Uh, then we go up to this cell here, and it's minus 
5.09 volts. It's actually been slightly reverse charged and that is taboo. That's not a good thing at all. That's the peril of having them in uh, series like this uh, when there is a slight parasitic current draw from the control circuitry. It can potentially uh, cause the first cell to go flat to be reverse charged. So the cell voltages are not good in these packs. That's a shame. But anyway, <clears throat> that is... I think the message to take home here is that if you have one of these packs that's 388 volt, by the way, it's, it says it says HL18 to 388 V automatic adjustment, notably just 18 volt, because it is just an 18 volt pack effectively. But I think the main takeaway from this is that as soon as you get these, you should charge them and just at least once a year top them up just make sure if you're not using a tool in a long time just make sure you just top the cells up every so often just keep them keep them active because uh, otherwise if the voltage goes too low it does damage lithium right okay i shall dismember the, one of these packs and at this point in time i think for safety i'm just going to end up discharging these completely to zero to make them safe to recycle because the biggest danger in lithium cells is the sheer energy density in them because uh, it's not the amount of lithium it's if you were to cut one of these cells in half when it was fully discharged to zero absolutely nothing would happen if you were to charge it up to its full 4.2 volts or higher and you cut it in half then it would release all that energy in a massive bang and flames and that's where the real hazard comes from the amount of lithium is small and it's diffused through the material so by if you have a faulty battery and you wish to dispose of it safely then uh, discharge the cells to zero. However, let's get this circuit board off, take a picture and reverse engineer it. One moment, please. Reverse engineering is complete. Let's explore. And there's some oddities about this. Now, for reference, I'll zoom in this. Uh, for reference, I did put a slight charge into the other um, battery pack on my bench power supply. And I... Uh, Raise the voltage of all the cells, the one that was lagging behind, the one that had the slight negative voltage, wasn't taking much of a charge. And then when I took it off the charge and left it sitting for a while, it went back down to zero very quickly. So that cell has either experienced dendrite growth, uh, which has pierced the separating film, or there's been an ele electrolytic transfer of uh, solids effectively into that it's been contaminated the separator film and it's basically conductive now that means the cell is no good that really hints that none of those cells should be trusted it's recycling time okay let's take a look at this there's something very odd they've used a very standard chip a cm1051 but they've used weird circuitry this mosfet here in particular uh, is the oddity and uh, they've had to drive this MOSFET with this little transistor down here, this bit of green circuitry here. That took the most time to reverse engineer because it's completely off the specification of the chip. But we have nice, solid connections here, well mounted onto the circuit board. And we have the extra one for charging. Now, it does, I think it makes reference to this being Makita compatible, and it may be that that's why the circuitry is like this, because they have uh, made it so that it can actually use that extra pin for charging, and it's positive as opposed to uh, the normal circuitry actually being done just by two connections, a positive and negative, or an extra negative charging connection. We've also got the little jack socket, as many of these little Chinese ones do, so that they can supply a very, very cheap power supply that plugs into it, which is actually quite handy. Here are the MOSFETs, in, in channel MOSFETs, used to switch the output on and off. Uh, they'll switch it off in the event of the batteries running low or the uh, overcurrent uh, when too much current has been drawn and it measures the voltage across the MOSFETs for that. There are three positions. Technically speaking, if you put copulate the third position, it means it would become a higher current power bank, but that would be putting a bit of stress on the cells themselves. Uh, there is an extra diode here across the output uh, here and the positive and that appears to be to clamp i've seen it in other uh, battery packs to clamp uh, the sort of transients from inductive loads being switched and there's a little thermistor just dangling off it wasn't even it wasn't even tucked down in between the cells it was just basically in the pack uh, and it's also been fine-tuned with slightly off-label use uh, nice enough design other than that all the sense points along the uh, 
battery have a 1K resistor and then uh, a 100 nanofarad, I think, capacitor, all in a, with a nice common bus. It's a nice logical design, except for that weird bit there. Right, tell you what, let's take a look at the... Uh, Let's take a look at the suggested schematics by the manufacturer. So the first one is the one that allows you to have just two connections. And when you apply power, it acts like the DW01 cell protection chip, but on a much larger scale, and uh, lets you charge. It turns the pair of MOSFETs on. But the downside is then both MOSFETs need to be able to carry the full current of the load, and that just means expensive MOSFETs which is maybe why they didn't do that. But there is another variation in this, and this is what I thought they were doing. If we take a look at the other variation, and this is the one with component values written on it because I have uh, used this as the reference, although it's not actually a great reference, really, because it isn't quite this correct. But let's uh, follow this through. There's a diode across the battery and the output uh, in this version, there are two MOSFETs, but one can be much smaller because uh, it is only in the path of the charge circuit. But they've not done that anyway. They've kind of bypassed this circuitry here. But that would just make for a much cheaper system. And if a guessing that the Makita compatibility, if it is compatible with the charger, because it uh, charges positive as opposed to negative, uh, maybe that's why they went this approach. Not sure. The cell voltages are monitored by a 1K resistor and a what measured, I measured these capacitors in circuit, they were typically about 85 nanofarad up to about, say, 90 nanofarad. So let's just say that the closest to that, and with a nice round value, is 100 nanofarad, which is fairly common for uh, little filter circuits. And the reason for these these resistors and these capacitors just just to provide a nice, stable, filtered reference voltage here. And then the voltages between the cells are compared by the internal circuitry. And the first cell which drops below, say, 2.5 volts, it just turns the whole lot. It turns the MOSFETs off and shuts the system down. Or also, when it's charging, the first cell that goes up to about 4.2 volts, then it turns off the uh, charge output, which in this case would have turned that MOSFET off, but doesn't. I'll show you the circuitry for that in a moment. The thermistor has a divider, and it's notable that it can switch on and off, presumably here, RTV, um, resistor, temperature, voltage reference, or it might be a fixed voltage reference, but it may be able to turn it on and off just so it samples it every so often. But they've used uh, two 100K resistors. Uh, the thermistor is 100K. Uh, there's the 100K for the other one. And also they've added a 330K across the thermistor to fine-tune the value just to get the sort of like the temperature they wanted to trip at. Um, the current sense, Vinny, uh, it's technically measuring, as far as I can see, the voltage across this sense resistor, but that sense resistor isn't in use. So instead, they've put it across the MOSFET. So the voltage will be dropped across the MOSFET and it'll detect when there's excessive current from the MOSFET just by measuring the voltage across that, uh, which is a common thing. That's also what the DW01 does. Anything else worth mentioning on here? Can't really think of anything significant here. Um, the MOSFETs are KS2314. Uh, that's about it. Right, let's take a look at the modified schematic that they've done. I'll zoom in a little tiny bit closer. So here's the battery, here's the positive rail and the sort of battery, the circuit zero volt rail. And when you charge, it detects, presumably, it's going to detect, I think uh, ultimately it can't really detect um, directly between the positive and negative. I guess that ultimately the this MOSFET must always be in a sort of on state, except when it's off. I'm not sure what they're doing there. I've also missed a dot. Mm, got to get all the dots. But anyway, when you apply the charge, it there are two parallel Schottky diodes. And uh, when it's wanting to accept a charge, it turns this transistor on via these two very high value resistors. Um, and that in turn turns that MOSFET on. Um, which is able then to switch the positive charge voltage up to the positive rail. 
And uh, it really is just a level shifter. They've basically inverted. This is the output that was going to switch the negative MOSFET, but they've n instead it's switching a positive one via this transistor. Quite odd. I'm, I'd have to look at the Makita charging system to actually work out what they've done there. But there's the main output uh, MOSFET there, and there's the uh, voltage sensing resistor there. But as I say, there isn't a direct reference there. Hmm. Odd. Um... But that's uh, their deviation from the norm. It does work. And it is a sensible and simple design. The circuit board's quite nice. It's just unfortunate that uh, it does have that parasitic current draw, that tiny parasitic current draw that in my case uh, was toast to the battery packs because ultimately, um, I'll just zoom out now because that, that's the end of the video, isn't it really? Uh, Ultimately, it's just the fact that I left them for far too long. But if you have battery packs like that, I do recommend just top them up every so often. Just make sure, definitely if you use a power tool to the point that the battery runs right down to zero and it cuts off. And this applies to DeWalt, Makita, uh, Ryobi, all the brands, Milwaukee, all of them. Uh, if you run it right down to the point it cuts off. I recommend charging that as soon as possible. Definitely don't just get distracted and put the battery out of the way and forget about it for a few weeks because uh, that just runs the risk of it going too low. Um, and uh, certainly in this case, it was just it sat there for years. I didn't realise how long it had been sitting there. And that's why both those battery packs have effectively been destroyed. Oh, well, not to worry. These things happen. But there we have it. Um, I've ordered another little chainsaw off eBay because there's a newer version with a slight variant. I think it's more mechanical than anything else. And we'll take a look at that when it arrives. But that is it. This uh, interesting but dead pair of uh, rechargeable batteries.